I know there might have been adjustments over the decades, but today, what is the commonly held definition of life itself? So, so one definition that people like to use, which encapsulates what you're saying as like fundamental pieces of it is life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. So, you know, there's a lot of problems actually from my perspective with that definition. Um, one of them is whether you regard life to be self-sustaining. So viruses are an example. People don't know whether to place them as life or not. Um, because they're not self-sustaining on their own. And in fact, when we're doing, uh, you know, chemical evolution in the laboratory, like trying to study molecules, uh, you know, we don't know how to call them alive because they're not self-sustaining because graduate students are pipetting, you know, like they, they require the graduate student. Um, so the pipetting, it, that's a verb. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Pipette, yeah. But yeah. it's a little thing. Straw. Yeah. yeah. Put yeah. a little glass straw in there. Yeah, yeah. So Yeah, you gotta move you gotta move the molecules from one tube okay. to the next right. to do artificial selection. So why do you do it? You say, I am crushing your yeah. head. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> right. So so there's many or or my favorite example is like, you know, a parasite that um, you know, sits in the the a brain of an ant. And you know, pilots the ant, right? Right. So I, I talk about that example in my book. I love actually, that but parasite, by the way. It's so crazy. Yeah. But is that is that a living? Is that a life form? Because it's actually you know it's a symbiont, right? So right. or actually a parasite. Um, so this idea of self sustaining is kind of very problematic for a lot of uh, reasons. I don't actually think life is defined by chemistry. So this is again getting at deeper physical Ooh. principles. Wow. So mm. I um, include the, the technology. Blood yeah. Right. Yeah. For, yeah. For shots fired. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So my definition, or well, my understanding of life, I don't have a definition. My understanding of life is life is the things that can only be produced by evolution and selection. And technology is also an example of that. And that's not chemical. Right. Um, and also this idea of it being self-reproducing. I mean, there are plenty of humans that can't self-reproduce. Actually, no human can individually self-reproduce. Right. Well, uh, I've been trying. Yeah. But there's plenty of things. I've been trying. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but a mule, for example, yeah, exactly. it, is, is certainly right. alive. Exactly. Right. Can't right. reproduce. Can't reproduce. Yeah. And those are, those are kind of odd examples because we bred them. But even if you think of like a bee in a colony, right? Like most of the bees can't reproduce alone. Are they not right. alive? Right. Because they're part of a social right. network. Okay. So, right. so, yeah. so the traditional definition of life have issues. Lots of issues. Plus, Every single word. <laughs> plus there, there are stars that have metabolisms mm -hmm. and they live out their lives and die. And then they explode and send their materials to other gas yeah. clouds that make other stars. Right. So they do reproduce. And right. there's some heritability there because of the elements that get made in one star the generation. DNA, one yeah. star goes in another yeah, star. That's right. So are stars alive, right? We can yeah. ask that question. Yes, we could. So, so can I ask any question. So, so <laughs> why even have a definition at all? The way that I consider it is that we actually don't need to define life. We need to figure out a theory that helps us derive the properties of life. So we should be able to predict features of life anywhere it should occur in the universe. So that's been my approach. It's very, you know, theoretical physicist need to build theories, need to explain regularities Man. of nature. So, I mean, basically you're like, let's not worry about identifying. Let's find out what creates the identification. Yes. In the first place. Right. Yes. Wow. So yeah. how, how do you go about doing that? Um, so I started, you know, in a true theorist fashion, I had probably like seven or eight working definitions, but I was trying to find you know, what's the commonality under them. But a lot of them were about something to do with information structuring matter was kind of the early way I was thinking about it. Wow. Okay. I got you because then that gets you all the way down to single cells because even they are carrying information. So if you get to the root of the information in what yeah. creates the information, then it may not even be a cell that you're working with. It could be something outside of that. Yep. Yeah. And a cell is a good example because it's very complex and we don't think they can form outside of evolution. So the way that we talk about these ideas now, which is what I'm really excited about, is this theory, assembly theory I've been working on uh, with my collaborator, Lee Cronin. And assembly. Theory. Assembly theory. Uh -huh. It's a theory. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> As a theorist should do. Yeah. So assembly theory's key conjecture about the nature of life is life is the only physics that can generate complex objects. Interesting. Like a cell. Right. Or oh. a microphone. Oh, so or a comedian. <laughs> we're not that complex, unfortunately. <laughs> He's we, very simple. We're the simplest of all life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are declaring that rocks and crystals and things is not complex. So therefore, while you could in principle create those out of your modeling or out of your theories, that's not your target of interest. So the nature of how we define complexity is it doesn't happen spontaneously. It requires evolution. So there are some kinds of rocks and minerals that do require, say, technology to precisely engineer defects 
in a crystal, like if you want a perfect diamond or something. Right, exactly. Or um, so there would be rocks maybe that pass the boundary of life, but they would be something life created or engineered. So I love this because you poured out the mold and you said, let me start from scratch. And if you start from scratch, you're not biased by any pre-existing construct for what is or could or should be. Right. Now you, you can make almost anything that has complexity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the space of complexities is then what you will study. Yes. And that space is huge. So as an astronomical example, uh, you know, I like to use this molecule taxol as an example. It's molecule rates about 853. Ta taxol? Um, what do we do with that? Taxol is, is an anti-cancer drug. It's just one molecule that bio, like, that's been created a in a tree molecule. somewhere. It's a fat molecule. It's a big molecule. But if you wanted to and make- And how many atoms are in that molecule? Um, Approximately. I mean, hundreds or- I think, Gobs no. and gobs. Um, gobs um, official I think term. it's like- a couple hundred. Yeah, so on that order. Yeah, or 100 to 200. Mm -hmm. um, but if you wanted to make one molecular structure of the same molecular formula, like every single three-dimensional conformation, it would fill a volume of about one and a half universes. Just one molecular formula. One, centimeter, one molecule per centimeter cubed. This is how big chemical space is. The reason it's hard to make complex objects is there's so many of them. So evolution is necessary to select in that space. Uh huh. So you like we can't have a, a universe and a half full of just tax. I'll be very boring. Right. We live in a universe with lots of different complex objects. Wait, 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 wait I have to let me repeat what I think you said. Yeah. That the complexity of what's it called again? Taxol. 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 It's not a special molecule either. I just picked one out of a hat. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, we all have these we, in our hat, exactly. don't we? <laughs> Yeah, I'm carrying around a hat with lots of tax all in it. You know? So, so, it's so what more like a ski mask. If I think I understand you, yeah, the complexity of this molecule is such that if you explored all molecules that could be that complex, mm -hmm. there's not enough room in the universe, the universe to contain it. it. That's right. So clearly, that molecule's existence comes from some prior mm -hmm. requirement. Or for, or that, for that configuration. For that configuration. Right. That's, yes, that's yeah. exactly right. That's okay. fair. Yes, that's All exactly right. right. So, so let me ask you this then, because now I'm, I'm a little, phew, you'll have to forgive my ignorance, but I'm the only non-scientist here. Thank God. Uh, so I can say stupid. God stuff. had nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay, but go on. That's a very complex molecule. <laughs> okay. <Anyway. laughs> right. Okay. Um, where exactly does spontaneity and selection cross? And how do you identify which is which? Which is oh, I love this which question. is a progression and which is a cross yeah. so, pollination. You know, the kinds of very simple molecules that might happen on a planet, you know, can happen spontaneously. Or if you're thinking like Lego are easier for people than chemistry, if you have like a tray with a bunch of Lego in it and you shake it, you're gonna get some Lego sticking together and making simple shapes. So those okay. would be spontaneous objects. But you're not gonna be able to shake it long enough to have Hogwarts castle spontaneously emerge out of it. That would require a process of evolution and refinement. And building. a wand. And a wand, okay, yeah. No magic the though, the universe doesn't have magic. Oh. <laughs> At least not in this scenario. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> she's covering her bases. I know, she's like, you know what, she, She's in a Beyond she Institute. She was like, I am a theorist. <laughs> so no, but she's in a Beyond Institute. You gotta leave her room yeah, for the magic. Room. Right. For, for the wand. Well, go ahead. <laughs> well, I like, you know, magic for me is uh, yet to be, you know, regularized in theoretical physics. So there still always has to be other things for us yeah. to do. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or the laws of physics. <laughs> Good. Wow. Okay. So go ahead. Back to you can't get to the place of uh, where you could shake it and then have Hogwarts. So, so yes. if you do shake it and, and some stick together, together, those are like the amino acids. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Because we did, kind of, yes. we did that with the Miller-Urey experiment. Yes. That's right. Where he just throws yeah. some basic. Oh, can you uh, explain that, please? Everybody knows that Miller. Uh, uh, <laughs> They don't. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, of course I know. I'm just talking about the people out no, there who do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there may be someone please listening. Regale us of yes, the please regale us about the yes. Yeah. So uh, Stanley Miller was a PhD student. I think he published a paper in 1953, so it was a long time ago. But basically, he put you know a bunch of molecules that might have been available on the early Earth in a flask and put some lightning in his flask and tried as to model. As a source of energy. Yes, right. as a source of energy, and uh, he had a reducing environment, and then. And, you know, he got amino Reducing acids means out you're of it. Yeah. Oxygen is t taken out. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. And so he made amino acids. And, you know, people were so shocked by this at the time. They thought little aliens were being crawling out of, you know, life forms would be crawling out of the test tube in a couple of weeks. But that's not what happened. 
Right. Unfortunately. Yeah. The reducing environment is that we think the early Earth did not, not have, have free oxygen. oxygen. Right. 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 So, so he's <clears throat> trying to, if, if life's formed on Earth under well, these you conditions. Well, you got to create the conditions on, right. under and which so it what, formed. So what came, so out of the ooze, nothing crawled out. But nothing crawled out. If you run the experiment long enough, you basically get what we call a tar in prebiotic chemistry, which is just an undifferentiated mess of a whole bunch of organic molecules that we can't identify. Okay. Gotcha. Prebiotic chemistry means what? Prebiotic chemistry means chemistry that could plausibly happen on the early earth in the absence of life. Before you have life. Before you have life. So it's, or, it's organic uh, chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the word organic chemistry better because prebiotic kind of makes it sound like it's predisposed to become biological, but there's no teleology. There's it also no direction. makes it sound like right. something you yeah. take before a meal. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Yeah. People do confuse it with probiotic exactly. all the time. Oh my gosh. <laughs>